Um, well, I, I'm, I really love that Stephen opened the session this morning talking about Irish monks saving Western civilization um, by preserving books. Because um, you may not pick it up from my accent, especially if you're listening to the translator. Um, I am in fact Irish and I like to think that I am continuing the tradition by helping to pre preserve our cultural heritage. Although I am not, I hope you can tell a monk. <laughs> so, today I'm going to talk about the challenges and opportunities um, in the preservation of digital information uh, from the perspective of European research libraries. Um, I'm talking about digital information because I've I work almost exclusively on digital library projects and if I spoke about physical um, preservation and conservation, well, it would be a very short talk. In fact, I'd have to phone a friend. So, I am talking from a European perspective, but I hope that some of the challenges I talk about will resonate with you here in, in Latin America. So. Well, to break it down, what I'm going to talk about today is, first of all, I will give you an introduction to my organization, Libre. Um, I will look at some of the drivers for uh, investing in digital, digital preservation in Europe. And you might recognize some of these drivers here. And then also the challenges and opportunities that digital preservation pre presents. And I'll give you an example of how we are uh, addressing these challenges and harnessing these opportunities through some of the projects that I'm involved in. So I'm really delighted to be here. I think this is the first time that Libra has come to Latin America. Uh, we are the Association of European Research Libraries, and we have over 450 members from all over Europe. And by research libraries, we mean uh, not just uh, academic libraries, but also national libraries. All of the national libraries in Europe are members of our organization, and also special libraries. And we don't just mean the biggest and the best libraries, we mean the biggest and the best and the smallest and the most challenged. And we try to bring those libraries together to share best practice. We have a mission, and it's an ambitious one, it's to provide an information infrastructure to enable research in Libra institutions to be world class. So what we're here to do is to support libraries and supporting researchers. And that's a big job, but we've broken it down into three areas. <coughs> so our three areas are reshaping the research library. And this is about changing the leadership from within. It's also about um, looking at the way information is changing, for example, digital information, and how we ensure continued access to that. Um, advocacy, which has been really important for us. Five years ago, Libra didn't have any staff. Um, we just had really, uh, I guess you could say, hardworking members. Five years later, we have five staff, and we're involved in a lot of projects, and that's because of advocacy. Uh, we have been able to advocate at European level to have research libraries recognised as a research infrastructure. And this has opened up a world of funding to us and given us a voice at policy level. And because of that, then we are now working in scholarly communication and research infrastructures. So we're helping to, to build the European research infrastructure. This means uh, building infrastructure for, uh, for data, for open access, um, for researchers to collaborate. And I won't go into each of them, but you can see all of these symbols represent the different projects that we're currently working on. There's a lot, and I'll mention maybe two of them today. So let's look at uh, digital preservation. That's why I'm here to speak to you. Um, and activities impacting preservation in research libraries. Well, currently we know that libraries are engaging in mass digitization projects. We know that um, in a lot of countries, uh, the deposit of foreign digital material is being legislated for. So for example, in the UK, they've brought in legislation that now mandates that the National Library must collect foreign digital materials such as websites. 
Some libraries are collecting it anyway because they believe it's part of what they do. Uh, so they are collecting relevant websites. They're obviously preserving and collecting e-journals with the help of, of the Fox Archive. And also, um, we are increasingly responsible for institutional repositories. There's more that I've learned today. And we are developing a role in supporting research data management. There are just some of the things impacting us, but I'm sure you can think of more. Now, the driver for digital preservation, or investment in digital preservation, one of, one of them is to support scholarship. Now, we know scholarship is changing. It's increasingly collaborative. It's interdisciplinary. Um, there are changes in information-seeking behavior. The Google generation performing shallow searches, expecting everything online instantly. And an increasing culture of openness among scholars. They're the things that are changing, but some things stay the same, and that's why we need digital, digital preservation. This is a, a quote from uh, Paul Grant from uh, the report No Brief Candle. It's pretty old news at this stage, it was written in 2008, but still very relevant. And this quote I really love because it encapsulates why we need to invest in digital preservation and why it's important for scholarship. So he says, one thing about scholarship will never change. Scholars will demand access to information resources to examine what others have discovered and thought, to use and reuse evidence and scientific conclusions, and to publish results of their own research based on these resources. That's the same as it ever was. Um, and here is a sentence, this is the killer sentence, which tells you why digital preservation is so important. That is why their sources must be authentic, reliable, easy to find and retrieve, and easy to use and reuse. All of these concepts underpin digital preservation. Now, about access, I think we've already mentioned that there's no point in preserving without also providing access. Um, we did a survey of our members to find out uh, whether they were prepared for sustainable digital preservation. And one of the questions we asked them was, um, in the eyes of your decision makers, what are the most important reasons to invest in digital preservation? And this is from the point of view of research libraries. But I think it's telling. Number one benefit uh, of digital preservation to research performing organizations is increased use of content as a result of better findability and availability. Now, I guess I, I was um, put thinking uh, by the talk by uh, Sergio Lopez Ruelas yesterday when he spoke about the director from Amazon um, criticizing libraries uh, because they're behind on the ebooks curve. And I, I was thinking that this is not really uh, sounding the death knell of libraries. What, what he was doing was really making the case for investment in libraries because Amazon are about one thing and one thing only, and that's selling books. Libraries are about providing access to books. So in 100 years' time, maybe in 10 years' time, or even one year's time, the books that are available on Amazon may not necessarily be available. The libraries can ensure that we have continued access over time. The number two benefit uh, of digital preservation to research performing organizations is to ensure the integrity of research results. We've had a few scandals in Europe where we've discovered that researchers have made up their data. It's shocking, I know. And this is particularly shocking in the Netherlands where a psychologist did this. And so we need better transparency. We need to be able to check our research results and the integrity of the, the data. Now, number two driver. Well, we need to protect our investment. This, um, let's see. This lovely lady. Her name is Neely Cruz, and she is the Vice President of the European Commission. But more importantly for libraries, she is the Commissioner for the Digital Agenda. 
So she basically gets to tell us what to do, and we're happy about that because she gives us money to do it. And um, so here are a few things that media has asked us to do. Make all of your cultural heritage available online by 2025. Um, make all public domain masterpieces available in Europeana, which is your digital cultural heritage portal. And um, so that's just going to cost small 10 billion euro a year for the next 10 years. So I'm thinking we should probably preserve that investment. So there are the drivers, but we have some challenges. First of all, it's such a headache thinking about all of the format types that we have to deal with, all of the content types. We're talking about scholarly discourse, but that is no longer just journal articles. Uh, this can now include blogs, for example, um, digital cultural heritage, everything we've digitized, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about that. Ebooks, research data, dynamic web content. It's a huge challenge. Um, this was just to il illustrate the challenge of, of preserving research data. Um, the data publication pyramid. Now, we have some pretty good solutions for publications with data. Talk to this man over here. Um, process data and data representations uh, within or stored by the publishers. I'm assuming you've got a solution for that too. Uh, data collections and structured databases. Um, normally they have some sort of preservation policy. But we have a job to do here. Raw data and data sets and drawers. And that's an advocacy job. I wanted to bring in the example of European newspapers because it shows how we're digitizing stuff, enriching it, but also creating a problem for ourselves. So you can see here, we digitize these newspapers, and um, we've also applied special technologies to them, so optical character recognition, so we have machine-readable text, but also optical layout recognition. So you can recognize titles, sections, and so on. And named entity recognition, which we touched on yesterday. So we have um, people like Napoleon, places like Frankfurt. And so we have enriched this content, but we want to make sure that we preserve that very special metadata. Challenge two is how do we pay for this? Um, a very good place to start if you want to look into this is the Blue Ribbon Task Force Report on Sustainable Economics for Digital Preservation. This gives us five things that we should address. Recognition of the benefits by key decision makers, that's basically advocacy. Um, a process for selecting digital materials for long-term preservation. Um, mechanisms to ensure allocation of resources. And appropriate governance. Um, and also incentives, which is really legislation and mandates. So how are we doing in Europe? Not so great on the economically sustainable digital preservation front. This is a selection criteria. In red, we have the libraries who are not actually active in digital preservation. And in blue, we have the libraries who are. So we ask them what's your selection criteria, which is more important. Now with the blue, Everything's the same. So they don't discern. They have no selection criteria. Resource allocation. Where does the money come from? Well, good news is that quite a bit of it comes from institutional budgets. A bit of it comes from government budgets. This is not so good. 26% from project funding. That's not sustainable. And then we have a little tiny 2% here that comes from revenue. We need to think about how we can grow that. We also have a lot of skills, as uh, we spoke about earlier. Incomplete cost models. We don't know how much it costs. Business models that aren't sustainable. But the good news is that we are open to working together to, to um, build new revenue streams. Now, how many of you think digital preservation is important? 
<laughs> um, so, then if you do think, uh, if you think it's important for your organization, you should think about putting it in your strategy and your mission and vision, because that tells everybody else you think it's important. And we found that 57% had it in their strategy, 49% had it in their mission and vision. 89% said they thought it was important. So why don't they do something about it? Now, opportunity one, collaboration. Um, we are not the only sector struggling with digital preservation. Industry is as well, publishers are as well. And we need to work together to kind of solve these challenges, build a common vision that we can share with decision makers, uh, identify opportunities for shared services, and shared infrastructure. So we have done this in Europe under the banner of uh, an organization called APARSIM, which is the Alliance for Permanent Access to the Record of Science Network. It's a long one. Um, and this brings together all of the stakeholders, industry, scientists, libraries, publishers, and we've built a common vision of the digital preservation landscape. Not that we all see it the same way, but we all have different challenges, and now we know what they are. We're developing shared services, we are developing courses, and we're talking to each other and, and, and advocating for investment in digital preservation. The, this is my last example, my last slide. And this is it's a drawing that we came up with three weeks ago. It's for Europeana Cloud. And Europeana Cloud is going to be an infrastructure uh, for metadata and data that will be shared by the libraries, archives, museums and galleries. And they can sit on top of Europeana. And it's where they can store their data and users can access it directly. They can build their own tools. And it just is an interesting way where small and big organizations are collaborating and sharing services and ultimately providing access. And we're just mapping it, such a challenge because everybody has their different needs. Institutions have their different needs. Users and creators have their different needs. And aggregators as well. But if we hope to launch this cloud in roughly two years' time. So this is what the cloud is. It's common storage infrastructure for metadata and content. It will increase the access accessibility of the content. We'll develop common standards for metadata and facilitate the development of tools and also push out linked open data. So um, I'd just like to say thanks again for having me here. And um, yeah. thanks.